Good morning, church. This is Commander Steven here, and uh, today would normally be Ranger Sunday, so I wanted to take a moment and just tell you guys that we miss you, uh, and we can't wait for an outpost meeting when we get to have another one, and to also remind you of the, the Ranger motto, which is to be ready, ready for anything, ready to work, play, serve, and obey God's word. Thank you. Good morning, church. This is Life in Christ, live stream service, or somewhat live stream. We welcome you, and we want you to just enter right in, right off the bat, worship the Lord together with us, and I want to remember, want you to remember that today is the first Sunday of the month. The first Sunday of the month, we normally have communion service. So stick around at the close of this service. We're going to uh, observe the Lord's Supper together. This is your time to go to the refrigerator and get some juice or, and bread or whatever you need. And to, we, we're going to have communion and, together and worship the Lord. I do want to, before we go any further, I do want to thank you for uh, being faithful with your tithes and offerings. The Lord is blessing. The Lord is providing for our needs. And he will provide for your needs as you give to him as well. And so we're just trusting the Lord. Even this week, we are able to help a family through your generosity, and we have so appreciate that. One other thing is that this Wednesday, we are going to have a live Zoom fellowship prayer meeting. So if you're interested in joining us for that Zoom meeting this Wednesday at uh, 7 o'clock, give me an email at pastorallen at lifeinchrist.church, and we will send you a link to join us for that wonderful fellowship and prayer time. I'm pretty excited about doing that. So without any further ado, I want to thank uh, Pastor Tristan for leading us in our worship this morning and their, her team. And we're going to pray together and then we're just going to worship. Father, I thank you that uh, we have this opportunity to gather together. We enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise, being thankful for, unto you, for you are the giver of every good and every perfect gift. I pray, Lord, that your name would be exalted, that you draw people closer to yourself, and that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive all that you have for us. And all of God's people said, amen. All right, let's worship the Lord together.
Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to know you. We're looking forward, Lord, to the time when we can gather together with the saints here, but also a time one day where we join the angels in worship and praise without any energy restraints, without any time restraints, but just worship you, Lord, for you alone are worthy. I pray, Father, that you would guide and direct us now, that you would minister to each home represented here, each home, Lord, that is watching today. I pray in Jesus' name that the anointing of God and the blessing of God would be upon them, and that you would bring healing where there needs to be healing, that you bring restoration and you bring joy and peace, the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, Lord. I pray, Father, for the presence of God in these homes. I pray that you would make yourself known by many infallible proofs that you would draw us closer to you now. We pray, Lord, that you would open up our hearts to the Word of God here today, that we would be, we would be what you would want us to be, with ears to hear and hearts to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to thank the worship team, Tristan and Drew on the drums, and Leslie behind me, and Laura and Stephen. What a wonderful time. And then, of course, to make this all work, we have uh, Stephen in the back working on their sound, and Colleen and Richard. We're a team all coming together. And to last but not least, the support of my wife. <laughs> We're all lost without her. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Just the last verse of the normally what is the communion service that we have, that the verses that I use for that. And I'll go back to those verses at the close of this service. But right now, I'd like to read just out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. It says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. It's interesting that even at the communion service, the Lord Jesus gave us a reminder that he's coming back. He's coming back. That's a fact. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus has a great uh, discourse about that whole deal. Matthew 24, the uh, verse, I'll just read a few verses. I'll read 12 verses out of Matthew 24, starting at verse 32 says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation but will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not, never pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in the, in, as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did, did not know until the flood came and took them all away, and so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. 
Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. This chapter here was a story of, uh, or a response to a question that the disciples asked of our Lord. The question was that uh, what, what is the sign of your coming and that of the end of the age? And so Jesus goes on and tells them some of the story behind that. And he says, well, there will be many false Christs that will come. False Christ means, the word Christ means anointed ones. Those that, that appear like they have an anointing of God or, or something, they were very spiritual, and they claim to be deliverers or whatever. And he says that there will be many of those that will come along and deceive many. Then there will be wars and rumors of wars. He said, but that's not it. The end is not quite yet. Jesus said that there would be nations that would rise up against nations and famines and pestilences and earthquakes and persecution and hatred of the Jews and of Christians, false prophets, and the love of many would grow cold. That's what he says. But he says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. So all these things, he said, would be the foreshadowing of the second coming of the Lord. Jesus said that when he comes again, it will be very similar to the times of Noah. Uh, in that, not, not the depravity, he's not talking about that, about the times of Noah. He's talking about how it was that they were all surprised. Because life was going on pretty normal. People were still getting married, commerce was still happening, and most people were busy about their lives thinking nothing of spiritual things or of eternal judgment or eternal destinies. Life was just going on. And he said, just like the days of Noah, so will be at the end of the age, at his second coming. Also, Jesus said that at his coming, it would appear that uh, he would appear just like they saw him go up into heaven. He ascended up into heaven and a cloud received them out of their sight. He will come again with clouds, he says, and every eye shall see him. Just like they saw him go, they will see him come back. And he will come after the tribulation, after the, after the Antichrist tries to set up his kingdom with Jerusalem as the capital, and after the judgments on the earth upon the people who are living, and after the battle of Armageddon, and he will come before the seven-year tribulation to take up his, his bride, uh, or maybe during the seven-year tribulation, or maybe he'll come at the end of the tribulation. I don't know. You know, I mean, when I say come, that means come to catch his bride away, you know, the, what we call the rapture of the church. Honestly, it could be before the tribulation, it could be in the middle of the tribulation, it could be at the end of the tribulation. We'll see. All I know for sure is he's coming. He is coming. Jesus is going to blow the trumpet and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together at, to meet the Lord in the air. And this is called the rapture of the church or the, the catching away. As part of God's army, and I hope you are part of God's army, as part of God's army, you and I as believers will join Him when He comes down from heaven as the conquering King of kings and Lord of lords. The rapture of the church could happen at any moment. There are some things that Jesus says about his second coming that actually have a timetable to it. But the rapture of the church is different. These are two separate events. The second coming of the Lord is at the end of the battle of Armageddon and at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. And at that time, Jesus will come and set up his kingdom to rule and reign on the earth for 1,000 years down here. The book of Revelation talks about the tribulation period as well as the book of Daniel. And it's interesting how Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, he says that at the end, people will be running to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Boy, isn't that today? Isn't that today? Daniel and Revelation, uh, the book of Revelations, correlate with each other. Written hundreds of years apart, 
and, and two different languages and, and different cultures, yet they, yet they mend to, uh, meld together, melt together, whatever it is, and, and they all work together. Daniel talks about, uh, and if you don't believe prophecy, just read the book of Daniel. Daniel talks about four uh, kingdoms that would rise, the, the Babylonians, the Medes, and, before, and then the Medes and Persians, the three of these before uh, hundreds of years, before it had even happened. The Babylonian Empire, the Medes and Persian, the Greece, and then, and then Rome. And, and, and at the end, the Rome comes up and then it comes kind of uh, falters and, and then at the last days it comes back up. And Revelation and Daniel work together and they tell how, how they reveal the Antichrist, the ten leaders that will be aligned with him. Three of them will be usurped and uprooted. There was a mark. Uh, that you couldn't buy or sell. Listen, remember this? There, there's a mark. We, we know about all of, about the mark of the beast and all that. That's what it says. It says you couldn't buy or sell without that mark. That's talk, called government control, isn't it? <laughs> and and uh, the technology is all set up right now. Everything is set up. Now, or, now all these things are coming to pass, happening. And many believe that in the last days, the United States will be greatly diminished somehow in order for everything else to take place. And we see how easily and how quickly that can happen. The rapture of the church could happen now or maybe later. But one thing I know is that it's in the Bible and it will happen before the end comes. And it's very very soon. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, with a trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise, rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord in the air, and thus we'll always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Listen, it's going to be okay. God's got it all under control. Amen? The apostles, I didn't hear any amens out there, okay? Amen? Okay, there we are. You at home, I hope you are following me. The apostles expected this to happen in their lifetime. The mystery of when he is coming has been kept a mystery on purpose. It keeps us ready, or at least it should keep us ready. However, the more signs we see happening, the closer we know it is even at the door. The signs of, of a one-world government and an and economy. The signs of China rising, and that's in the Bible. The signs of Russia rising again, the bear of the north, which Scripture calls in Ezekiel, Gog and Magog. The unrest in the Middle East. The unstableness of Iran, which the Bible calls Persia. The hatred of Israel. The escalation of wars and rumors of wars. The escalation of earthquakes and natural disasters and strange weather patterns. And of course, even now, with a pandemic around the globe. Along with all these signs, the Bible also says that the spiritual condition of the world will grow worse in the last days. It says that, that uh, there will be a lessening of respect for authority. Money and sex, sensuality and pleasure are the gods of this age. Second Timothy chapter 3 tells us that people would be unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, but yet having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Friends, these are the last days. Jesus also said that the go this gospel shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. The Apostle John in the book of Revelation saw around the throne of heaven people of every nation and every tongue and every tribe redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, singing and worshiping their Savior. All the world will have a witness before the end. And that's getting very, very, very close. 
That will happen before or during the tribulation. So we must be ready. Jesus said in Matthew 16, after he observed how they would forecast uh, the weather, and, and they would do that fine, but they could not understand what was right around the corner, according to the prophecies. And he says, he says, you hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Again, back to Matthew chapter 24, Jesus gives a parable of the fig tree that I just read. Most feel that the nation of Israel is actually the fig tree that Jesus was talking about. And he says, when the branches start putting forth leaves, you know that summer is near. near. So also, when you see these things, know that the time of the end is near, even at the door. Then Jesus said, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Now, what generation is he talking about? The generation that starts seeing the fulfillment of the true end-time events. The first and greatest of these signs is when Israel, the Jews, dispersed throughout the whole world, being subject to atrocities, being subject to annihilations, being subject to things throughout their history that tried to destroy them. But yet, in the midst of all of that, they came back to the nation that, or the, to the land that God had promised them and were established as a nation in the midst of their enemies. What a miracle after thousands of years of wandering. And the Bible says that the Spirit would draw them, especially from the north. This generation, the generation that sees this happen, will not pass until all these things take place. See, how, see what I mean? How close it is? This is as close of, as to a timetable that Jesus gives. No one knows the day or the hour, but you certainly can see when it is close. In another place, Jesus likens it to having a baby. There's a due date given, an estimate time, maybe, but it's an estimate, but it's in the ballpark. You can see what's happening. You can see the belly rising. You can, you can see that it's getting closer. You don't know ex the exact hour, but you know when the time is drawing near. And what is a generation? This generation shall not pay. What is a generation? In the 1900s, life expectancy, in the year 1900, life expectancy for a male was 46 years. For a female, it was 48. Today, life expectancy for a man is 76 years, and for a female, 81. On May 14th, not very many days away, Israel will be 72 years old. All the pieces are in place. Jesus could come for his church today. Nothing prophetically would stop him. He tarries because he doesn't want anyone to perish. I have observed a lot of young families, and the wife gets pregnant. And the uh, husband and wife, they watch the baby grow. They maybe get an ultrasound and see what's happening. It's amazing. It's amazing. They make plans for the ar arrival of this little one. They get a doctor or a, or a midwife. Maybe they have a baby shower. They make a dry run to the hospital or the delivery room. They, they pack a bag that, so that it's ready at a moment's notice because you never quite know and you want to be ready? Do you believe that Jesus is coming again? Do you believe he's coming soon? Are you ready? My wife leaves for a retreat every once in a while, not very often, but once in a while she takes off. And when she comes home, uh, she usually finds the house in pretty good shape. The bed is made. The dishes are done, the floor is clean, the carpet is vacuumed, etc., you know. I know that it'll make her happy, 
when she comes home, that doesn't have to worry about that. Her husband didn't act like a bachelor and just let things go. But you know what? And she probably knows this. The house didn't always look like that when she was gone. I knew how much time I had to prepare. And uh, in the meantime, I let the dishes pile up. Sometimes I picked up the towel off the floor and sometimes I didn't. Uh, I seldom made the bed. You know, anyway. <laughs> but when, when I knew when she would be coming, that time was short, then I got to work, you know. Now, if I wasn't sure when she was coming, then I would be forced to always be ready in case she came. Jesus gives a parable like that of the ten virgins who knew their Lord was coming back, but did not, did not know exactly when. Five were, fo- five, were, five were wise, there we are, and five were foolish. The wise stayed ready all the time. That's why they were wise. The foolish got ready too late. They came to the door and yelled and knocked, Lord, Lord, let us in, let us in. And the master said, I don't know you. Who are you? And then Jesus wraps up this parable by saying, Watch, therefore. For you do not know neither the day nor the hour which the Son of Man, when the Son of Man is coming. Watch, in other words, be ready. And how can I be ready? The next parable Jesus gives in Matthew 25, following the discourse on chapter 24, so it all fits together. He says how you can apply this and be ready. You can apply it by being being active and using what you have for him by serving him while you have a chance what a joy it would be would be to be found busy working for him when he comes and not merely wasting our greatest stewardship which is our time since i know that he would come and could come at any moment i don't want to be left behind and When he comes, I know that he's going to ask for an accounting of what I've done for him. I want to make sure that I have a short list of unfinished tasks. If I am forgiven as I I forgive, which Jesus says that is true, I want to make sure that I am forgiving everyone from my heart. I want to make sure that I'm praying for a forgiving spirit. If my relationships with Him is mirrored by my relationship with you, (laughs) then I want to make sure that I love people. I ask God to help me love people. If He has called me to be perfect and complete and holy even as He is holy, then I want to make sure I don't have an accumulation of junk in my life. I don't want to be watching smut on TV and sitting in a, or sitting in a theater that shows soft pornography and suggestive behavior when Jesus comes. I don't want to be in the middle of listening to off-color humor and, or spreading gossip around and stories about people that I don't really know whether it's the whole truth or nothing but the truth. I know only bits and pieces. I don't want to be caught in that kind of gossip. I don't want him to come while my eyes are wandering off of my woman, my wife, onto other options. I don't want him to come while I'm stealing from him and withholding my tithes and offerings. I don't want him to come while I'm promising something that I know I cannot fulfill and I'm being deceitful. I don't want him to come while I'm more busy pursuing my pleasures, my way, my entertainment, instead of His work and His way and His kingdom and His plan and His goals. And that would be that of bringing people to a saving knowledge of Him and a greater understanding and usefulness for His kingdom. Listen, I want us to be ready when He comes because He's coming soon. 
I want to be about working for his kingdom when he comes. I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Are you ready? Are you ready? He's coming soon. We're going to transition into having the communion service. And the communion service follows right this because Jesus actually used it as part of the communion service at the very last. Or at least the Apostle Paul mentioned, mentioned that. So it all ties together. So get your grape juice. And we're going to have a word of prayer during our communion service and make it real to you, personal to you today. Amen. This communion service follows right along with my message, I believe. At the very communion, first communion service was the Passover time. And a lamb was slain, and the blood was put over the doorposts of each home. But actually, they were looking forward several, a couple thousand years to the cross of Jesus, the real Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, not just covers it. That was the, the word atonement. They made an atonement for us, but Jesus more than made an atonement. Atonement means covering. But he shed his blood and wiped our sins clean, our, our slate clean. It just didn't cover it. But now, when they had the communion service here, they looked back. Instead of forward to the cross, the cross already happened, they looked back to the cross. But what Jesus was looking now for when he gave that, his, not only to the cross, but now he was looking forward again to when the purchase would be made and, and real and we would be with him and we'd all make it to heaven and be in fellowship with him. But if you don't know Jesus, you don't have fellowship with him, you're not ready. And I don't know I'm no prophet or a son of a prophet. All I know is I can read my Bible and I see the time is short. And Jesus said, he said, uh, uh, Paul said, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus the same night when which he was betrayed took bread. Listen, you have to first receive from the Lord, right? Open up your hearts to him. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So I have these emblems here. And I hope you have something or do it in your heart. This is symbolic of his broken body. It says that he gave, gave thanks, he blessed it, and then they partook. So Lord, in obedience to your word, we're looking at the price that you paid, that we have, might have freedom and wholeness in you. Lord, you know how people and the church in the world is so broken. But you are broken for them that they might be whole. So Lord, I pray that you would bring wholeness to us today as we partake together. Let's partake together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Thank you, Lord, for your promise. Your great promise. First, 
whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Calling in sincerity of heart and soul and mind. Calling with a, an understanding that we are sinners, but you are a Savior. But Lord, I thank you also for your promise that you're going to take us home. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. So Lord, as we partake together, help us to remember you're coming soon. Help us to be ready. May the, the emblem of your blood, may your blood that was shed for us cleanse us now of all sin. In Jesus' name, let's partake together. And if you're needing prayer or of accepting the Lord as your personal Savior or just need to talk, first email me at pastorallen at lifeinchrist.church and uh, we want to minister to you, all right? Let's close with a worship song as the worship team concludes this service. You still. 